Hey everyone, in this episode, we're going to be taking a look at the recent COVID mandates. Are your rights being violated? Are we stuck with COVID forever? I'll discuss how President Biden has finally pulled out all the stops and more on this episode of the New Deal Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome to the New Deal Podcast. I'm your host, Jerry Nutini. For more from the New Deal, head on over to thenewdeal.com for podcast episodes, blog posts, YouTube videos. Uh, you can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Head on over to medium.com where I've got some articles posted there. And wherever you're watching or listening or reading, please rate and review. Let me know how I'm doing. I would really appreciate it. Give me five stars. If you really like what I'm doing, I would definitely appreciate that. In today's episode, I want to talk about COVID in a different way that I have in the past a little bit. I was going to talk about a lot today. I was going to do abortion rights and the infrastructure bill and the debt ceiling and a little bit more on Afghanistan. And then Joe Biden gave a speech on, you know, the vaccine mandate for many people, for many Americans. And I started digging into that a little bit and I ended up with an entire episode. So rather than do a really long episode that will, you know, probably bore you halfway through, I thought I'd do separate episodes. I missed an episode last week. I was traveling for work. So maybe I'll do two, two this week just to play catch up if you guys don't mind. So uh, we're going to focus on COVID. COVID has managed to stay just as relevant as any other major topic in the news cycle for the past few weeks. It's managed to stay relevant even as we saw our withdrawal from Afghanistan, a Texas law that effectively bans all abortions in that state, rising tension over the national budget and the infrastructure deal and the debt ceiling, and even concerns over an upcoming right-wing rally at the U.S. Capitol on September 18th. We're still talking about COVID despite all of that. In other words, COVID is still the most important issue and the most dangerous public threat to the safety in America. And that's why I'm going to talk about it again. Despite a vaccine being available for the better part of a year now, we continue to see COVID spread in America with thousands of people still dying every day. Thousands, literally. We had over 3,000 people die on September 9th, a number that rivals some of our worst days from last winter. And to anyone who thinks COVID is behind us, just remember that we're losing just as many Americans in August now with a vaccine as we did last January with no vaccine. So we're not through this yet. A lot of this has to do with the unvaccinated population returning to normality, uh, but also abandoning all the safeguards that they should be employing, like wearing masks in all public spaces and social distancing as a rule. It's been said over and over and over again that if you're unvaccinated, you should be doing all of the same safety or, you know, employing all the same safety measures now as you've done the last year, uh, just because everyone else is, you know, taking their masks off and, you know, living a little bit more normal um, doesn't mean that unvaccinated people should as well because they didn't get vaccinated. Vaccination is the key to freedom, essentially. This could have been prevented, all of this, if states had employed common sense earlier this year and if they'd left a mask mandate in place until, say, July 1st of this year um, or even set vaccination thresholds prior to removing mandates. So, you know, if a state says, when we reach 65% vaccination, we'll remove our, our mandates. Uh, that didn't really seem to happen anywhere. Uh, in retrospect, I think that would probably have been the best way to do it. Incentivize your people, not through lotteries, but through, hey, we need to get to this threshold or else we're just going to stay locked down. You know, I, I think it would have worked. For some reason, states thought that people who wouldn't get the vaccine would suddenly play ball. Uh, they'd use the honor system, they take the precautions against the infections uh, and against the spread of the virus, and then the states and the federal government got stuck as a result of putting trust in the unvaccinated people. Because how do you put restrictions back in place when six out of every 10 Americans uh, in a state has been responsible and they get the vaccine? Uh, but the other four in 10 people are unvaccinated and they're spreading the Delta variant around, filling up the ICUs and morgues, and how do you restrict your population when the majority has done the right thing, but, but the result of the irresponsibility of the minority is so devastating that you feel like you have to do something about it. You can't. You can't put those restrictions in place. The responsible parties would be upset that they were losing the benefit of the said responsibility 
and that the anti-vaxxers would cry and complain because that's their thing. They cry and complain. We've seen some states uh, starring Rob DeSantis and sorry, Ron DeSantis and Greg Abbott um, go so far as to ban measures to protect their school children, such as mask mandates. Those two states are among the top three, top three in lives lost to the virus. And that's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence that the states acting most irresponsibly are the, st- are the states with the most cases and the most deaths. It makes complete sense. This is how correlation works. I suppose your argument would be that those who died did so of their own volition. Well, they didn't take the vaccine, they died, and that's their problem, right? Yeah, you know, whatever lets these people sleep at night for not making decisions to protect their citizens. Last week, LA became the first major city in the US to mandate vaccines for all of its eligible students. And as a trend, we will likely see continue, especially if numbers begin to spike in the next week or so. And I hope that is a trend we see continue because last year, what kicked off the surge was kids going back to school. And for some reason, it seems like we just didn't learn our lesson. I personally don't know why we're sending all kids back to school without vaccine mandates, without mask mandates, because they drove the surge over the winter. That was undeniable. But some states have mandates for masks or even the vaccine for their students, but that doesn't solve the issues of the adults who are fueling the surge, especially in the Southeast United States. The option, as I said earlier, is to either punish everyone, even those acting responsibly, or we can do the common sense thing, which is to address those who are the cause of the problem on their own, the unvaccinated people. And that is what the Biden administration is trying to do uh, last week and this week with those mandates. Biden released a six-point plan to combat COVID moving forward. He began that speech by addressing the unvaccinated, so I'm just going to play that clip for you here. My message to unvaccinated Americans is this. What more is there to wait for? What more do you need to see? We've made vaccinations free, safe, and convenient. The vaccine is FDA approval. Over 200 million Americans have gotten at least one shot. We've been patient, but our patience is wearing thin, and your refusal has cost all of us. So please do the right thing. So President Biden starts there by asking the unvaccinated population, what more do you need to see? There's FDA approval. Over 200 million Americans have received the vaccine, which is almost one in three. And then he goes on to say that his patience is wearing thin and that the refusal of the unvaccinated to get vaccinated had, has cost us all. And that's something I'm going to touch on later. But honestly, I wish we'd heard this kind of tone from the beginning. I don't know why we're only hearing this really, really hard line, drastic tone now. And I understand why we're hearing it now. We're getting into colder weather. We're sending kids back to school. A surge is imminent if we do not get more people vaccinated. And by the way, and I've mentioned this in previous episodes, if we had gotten 75 to 80% of Americans vaccinated, that's herd immunity. That's what we need to get to. We're sitting at 54. We still need 20% of Americans to get vaccinated to be approaching that herd immunity threshold. We're not close. And it's, it's been very, very slow. We've had like 4% more people, Americans, vaccinated uh, since like June. Um, everyone else was vaccinated prior to that. Um, so there's a big rush at the beginning and then it slowed way down. And now we're, we're stalled and we're paying for it. So I'm glad that he's asking those questions because when the majority of Americans has a vaccine, when we have FDA approval, when at this point, The evidence is before you that this vaccine is safe. I mean, no one is being tracked. Uh, We're all alive or, you know, the vast majority of us are alive. The side effects are negligible. Maybe your arm hurts a little bit. Maybe you get a little sick, just like any other vaccine. But that's apparent for anyone who's waiting to get the vaccine. The only reason you're not getting vaccine now is because you're buying into some information that isn't correct. But we'll get to that in a little bit. So here's the six part plan. Step one of the six-part plan is to increase vaccinations among the unvaccinated with new requirements. 
So Biden has mandated vaccines for all federal employees with no option to test out. Previously, you could either be vaccinated or if you took a COVID test, I don't know if it was once a day or once a week and, you know, showed that you did not have COVID, then you were good. You can no longer test out. You must get vaccinated. This goes for federal contractors as well. The Department of Labor is going to require businesses with 100 plus workers to make sure they're deploy, that their employees are vaccinated or tested. Not sure how that's going to be enforced. It'll be interesting to see, but good requirement, I think. 100 people in one space, let's get them vaccinated. Uh, they've encouraged large venues and retaining venues uh, to require vaccination, uh, especially you know if we're talking about indoor concerts, packing hundreds of people into a small space. You would hopefully want those people vaccinated. That could be, you know, become a hotspot and, and have like a, 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 a mini surge just because of one event. Uh, they've encouraged medical professionals uh, to encourage vaccinations to their patients. And they're requiring all 300,000 teachers that are part of the federal, Feds, federal Head Start program uh, to be vaccinated. Uh, overall, they say that this mandate will cover 100 million Americans. I'm sure many of them have already been vaccinated, but if it closes that gap, if it closes that final quarter and pushes us toward herd immunity, all for it. The second aspect of the plan was continued protection of the vaccinated. So first, TSA is going to be doubling fines on travelers who refuse to wear a mask. And I just want to play this clip of Biden talking about this TSA requirement in his speech last week. Tonight, I'm announcing that the Transportation Safety Administration, the TSA, will double the fines on travelers that refuse to mask. If you break the rules, be prepared to pay. And by the way, show some respect. The anger you see on television toward flight attendants and others doing their job is wrong. It's ugly. Show some respect. I love that line. And he said it and he meant it. And I'm glad that he's taking this tone. It's a more parental tone. And this is what we saw a little bit in the first clip as well. But it's necessary because at this point we have people who are unvaccinated clinging to misinformation as the reason that they're not getting vaccinated, they're buying into essentially lies, even like I said, with the reality before them. We've got people assaulting flight attendants because they're refusing to wear a mask. And I'm sorry, you know, it's a mandate that you need to wear a mask on a flight. You purchase your plane ticket, you go to the airport, you go through security, you get on the plane and then you cry about it. Then you throw your tantrum. That doesn't make any sense. It's it's extremely childish, but it's also really irresponsible. It's dangerous for you. We know bad things can happen on airplanes. We're right around the anniversary of 9-11 here. People who act like that on airplanes are, are looked at extremely suspiciously. Not a good idea at all, especially when you knew from the start you were going to have to wear a mask. Why'd you buy the ticket? Right? Anyway, so that was the first part of, you know, continuing to protect the vaccinated. He also wants to, step three, keep kids safe and keep schools open. The biggest point here was that the federal government is going to be willing to pay any funds lost to schools or those employees in which the state has mandated or said that they cannot have mask mandates. And if they implement mask mandates, the schools or the employees, they will lose the state funding. The federal government is saying, if you lose the state funding, we will fund you. Keep the mask mandate in place. And here's Biden on that. And this is the last clip I'll play from that. But I thought this was just an interesting take. And all school officials trying to do the right thing by our children. I'll always be on your side. Let me be blunt. My plan also takes on elected officials and states that are undermining you and these life-saving actions. Right now, Local school officials are trying to keep children safe in a pandemic while their governor picks a fight with them and even threatens their salaries or their jobs. Talk about bullying in schools. If they'll not help, if these governors won't help us beat the pandemic, I'll use my power as president to get them out of the way. The Department of Education 
has already begun to take legal action against states undermining protection that local school officials have ordered. Any teacher or school official whose pay is withheld for doing the right thing, we will have that pay restored by the federal government 100 percent. I promise you, I will have your back. Here we have a more defiant tone from President Biden, and he's calling out Ron DeSantis. He's calling out Greg Abbott, and he's saying that the federal government is not going to tolerate stupidity uh, and especially reprisal against school departments and educators that are trying to do the right thing. They're trying to keep kids safe because masks are not harmful. There's no harm in asking people to wear masks at all whatsoever. And so the federal government has the backs of the teachers and the educators and those school districts who want to keep the kids there safe. We've heard stories already about full schools that have kids quarantined or multiple classrooms in schools. Large majority uh, of the students in a school can't even go to school because they're quarantined because there's been an outbreak in the school. So just wear the mask, save everybody the trouble or go to full distance learning and just stop it all together. One or the other. But I was really happy to see Biden take this stance. I was really happy to, once again, hear that kind of tone. He has their back. He's being extremely straightforward, and he's being extremely confident in what he's saying. And the fact that he's addressing the governors, uh, I think, is, is really good. Uh, that's leadership. Uh, that's you know taking a stand for what is correct, because you lead the country, and you know that's what's best. And for too long, I think he's been a little timid on this. Uh, He's had moments where he's been good, but I think this is what we've needed to hear. So that's on the schools. The fourth step is better testing. Uh, So he wants more available testing, more affordable testing, more convenient testing. And he has used the Defense Production Act to ask companies to produce at-home COVID tests, tests, rapid tests, And these will be sold at major distributors at cost starting this week on Amazon, Walmart, Target. He named a bunch of distributors, Uh, but we'll be able to take COVID tests at home. So we'll be able to protect other people if we somehow test positive. Uh, And if we are having symptoms, we'll be like, oh, well, you know, it's a cold. I'm all right. Or it's allergies or whatever. Or, hey, I've got COVID. I need to quarantine uh, and, you know, make sure I'm not getting other people sick, uh, whether or not I'm vaccinated. And sometimes maybe if you're just feeling fine, take the test because it can still spread asymptomatically. Either way, these tests will be available at cost, uh, cheap for us to buy on major distribution platforms. The fifth step was protecting our economic recovery. Uh, The biggest point out of this was that he's expanding the money available to small businesses for relief. I believe he said that money will be available at low interest rates. It won't need to be paid back. I think he said for two years. Um, and it can be used for payroll and, and other business expenses and just to make sure that they can keep staff on and stay out of debt, um, which we've heard because we don't have another COVID relief package coming. So the fact that these funds will be available is kind of cool. And finally, he wants to support hospitals with new military personnel and improved medications, basically just making sure our healthcare system is working. It's operating as efficiently as it can with all the support it has. He's doubling military deployment health teams to hospitals around the country, especially those that are stressed out to their maximum. So that is the Biden six-point plan. I think it's relatively comprehensive. I think it does as much as it dares to do without getting extremely controversial. I think there's already enough controversy in there as is, but I think it's the right message. I think we're asking the right things of people. Um... I think if we want to beat the virus, we should have locked down. I I think that moment has probably passed. I think we've done it wrong um, the the whole time. Once we had the vaccine, I don't understand why we didn't lock down until we hit a threshold, maybe nationwide, 65% nationwide, lock down, then release the restrictions. Uh, That's not how it happened. We could have been through this, I think. Uh, but, But since we're not, I think this works. Now, COVID's been surging for two months. And over that time, the vaccine rate only increased 4%. And yet with just that 4%, we're seeing the beginnings of a decline in cases this week. That's how easy this can be. 
if we just all got vaccinated. I've had a lot of conversations about COVID over the last year and a half. I'm very active on social media. I'm willing to engage people that disagree with me. I'm willing to have those conversations. I'm willing to, you know, listen to their points and their counterpoints. And I make my points and my counterpoints. And I think it's at least gives me the insight into what people who disagree with me are thinking, whether they are anti-vax people or people who think, well, I got the vaccine, but it's not right for, you know, to demand of other people. So I saw a tweet last week on social media. And the tweet was, um, I think it was Ezra Klein, and he had retweeted someone else's thought. And I'll put it up on the screen here. Um, but but the, the tweet was basically pondering what COVID might have looked like if Mitt Romney were president instead of Trump, and maybe Romney was in a second term. And if instead of resistance in combating the virus, if instead of Trump, we had a president who wore a mask from the moment mask mandates were recommended, who urged all Americans to social distance, to stay home, to limit travel, what might America have looked like if a Republican president had set the example for Republicans early on? We wouldn't have any critics in Congress. None. Democrats and Republicans, I think, would probably have been united on this. We'd have no movement of ignorance because there would be no fear in the members of Congress, that they could lose their next election if they didn't perpetuate baseless lies of the leader of their party. Because the leader of their party would have been saying, let's wear masks, let's social distance, let's do the right thing, let's get through this. There would have been no benefit in perpetuating lies or pushing lies because doing so with Mitt Romney, Mitt Romney would never ignore the science. He'd never do that. He would never let down the American people like that because Mitt Romney is a man of principle. So it was just an interesting thing to think about. But I honestly think the answer is Democrats and Republicans would be have been united across the board up front, probably in a way that we haven't seen since 9-11. But because our president chose to make this a divisive issue in ways that are still unfathomable to me, not only that he was able to push kind of the stuff he did, but that people believed it made it a divisive issue. It's still a divisive issue and people are dying because of it. But it's interesting to think about Mitt Romney, maybe even Lindsey Graham, like as, as, as crazy as Lindsey Graham can be. I mean, is he illogical? I mean, he certainly toes the Trump line, but would he have bucked mask mandates? Would he have, you know, uh, doubted Fauci and diminished Fauci publicly and things like that? Um, because he is a lifelong politician, you think there's a degree of respect there that Trump lacked? Who knows? But maybe even a Lindsey Graham might have been better. Not so long ago, the vast majority of Americans made light of the very, very small group of people, uh, the traditional anti-vaxxers. Um, it took one man, one, one terrible president to turn half American into anti-vaxxers And those same people who are anti-vaxxers now made fun of the anti-vaxxers like two and a half years ago. They made fun of them and they ridiculed them on social media. They were crazy people. And now we have more anti-vaxxers because Trump told them to be anti-vaxxers. And that's the power of what we'll call negative populism. Um, That is populism that follows trends that are destructive. Just because something is a popular idea does not mean it's right, does not mean it should be followed, does not mean it's good, because the masses can be wrong or, or very, you know, large portions of a population can be wrong to the point that they're literally willing to die for lies. Um, and I often wonder how many Americans are dead today because of Donald Trump. I can absolutely with certainty say that Donald Trump is responsible for more American deaths than the total that we lost in the wars in Afghanistan, the Americans we lost in Afghanistan, or in Benghazi. We lost 58,000 Americans in Vietnam. 58,000 in Vietnam. We've lost 660,000 Americans to COVID to date. The lost lives in Vietnam equate to about 9% of all COVID deaths. So do I think that at least 9% of the lives lost to COVID could have been prevented if Donald Trump wasn't spreading lies. Absolutely. 
Yes, absolutely. I can say with certainty that Donald Trump is responsible for more COVID deaths in 2020 than total Americans lost in Vietnam and Afghanistan combined. Those are just the ones he's responsible for, like directly responsible. If he did not spread the lies, I can say with certainty that more Americans died because of him than in Vietnam and Afghanistan, which is crazy to think about. Vietnam is one of our most hated wars to look back upon. We lost Americans there. It, it, was, it was senseless. There was outrage because of it. We don't see that kind of outrage over, over the deaths that we've seen for COVID. It's, it's been sad. It's disappointing. We're upset with people who continue to spread the virus. But, we're, but where's the rage at the fact that we lost more people to COVID as a direct result of misinformation and lies spread by our president than we lost in those wars. That's crazy. It's crazy. It's wrong. And we need to reckon with that. Uh, we really do. So, so take it from my perspective. Look at, it, look at it from my seat. I know that so many of the people who are towing the GOP line, the anti-vax line, would have absolutely taken the vaccine if we had anybody else in office besides Trump. I know that because I know these people or I knew them. I can't now or may not ever understand how so many people, so many people change so drastically over the course of months and then devolve further into that madness over the four years that followed. Because the people who were Nuts over Trump were nuts over Trump before he was even elected. We're talking about people changing their entire outlooks and their entire personalities in months. There are people close to me in my life um, who I know that six years ago, they would have been the first people to make sure that I got vaccinated. Um, these people would have, they would have listened to the experts because they still understood then uh, that they were not smarter than experts. Um, they still had, you know, a level of, um, they were still humble. Um, they st still were, they still knew that, you know, they, if they weren't an expert in the field for 30 years, they probably shouldn't be, you know, directing people, uh, otherwise. They were people that valued education. So it's maddening to see in this pandemic, uh, to see it continue because People that you had confidence and faith in refuse to be part of the solution. And I still try to have faith in these people. I still try to have faith that they will wake up from whatever dream or trance they've been in and just return to common sense because I would be so grateful. I would be so relieved and so utterly happy that if that happened, I'd be so relieved just to see those people as their proper selves again that I, I couldn't be mad. I couldn't be mad. I'd be so happy just to see the return to normalcy. But my faith has not been rewarded. And so I'm left blaming those people. I'm left bitter and frustrated and disappointed. And at times I'm disgusted because their lack of action equates to a willingness to inflict harm and death upon others without a second thought. And they try to defend themselves with falsehoods peddled by figures with no expertise on the subject, people who are likely vaccinated themselves, by the way, but who understand that the anti-vax narrative sells. It's good for ratings. It's good for publicity. So why don't we tell some lies? Who cares that people die because of it as long as we get reelected or keep our ratings up or whatever it might do? It riles up right-wing voters. The anti-vax messaging riles up white right-wing voters. It keeps them engaged. Instead of just getting bored after the election and waiting till 2022, which is a midterm and, you know, typically has lower vote, voting turnout, it keeps them engaged. Oh, they're taking away your rights. They're making them get vaccinated. Oh, and now the right wing people are, they're engaged. It keeps them in the wings for the upcoming elections and nothing could be more important to elected officials. Certainly not something so trivial as the lives of other Americans. That's not important. We can kill people as long as we get reelected. That's why it's getting pushed. It's obvious. It's clear. It's transparent. But hey, who cares? Here's what we do know. The vaccine works. The states with the highest rates of vaccination have far fewer cases, far fewer hospitalizations, and far fewer deaths. Far fewer. The vaccine is so effective 
that there is currently debate as to whether we will even need a booster vaccine in the next year, because even though the efficacy of the vaccine wanes, it doesn't do it so much that we'd become more likely to have severe illness or need to be hospitalized. Between Texas and Florida alone, you know, Ron DeSantis and Greg Abbott, they make up nearly 20% of all lives lost in the pandemic. They have more deaths than New York. New York is a state that had an outbreak of COVID at a time when we didn't understand the virus. We didn't have enough masks and PPE, not only for people, but for the healthcare workers and doctors helping the COVID patients. This was at a time where they needed to drive in refrigerated trucks to store bodies because the morgues were full. And this was at a time when there were not even experimental treatments for COVID. Never mind Never mind a vaccine. There, there were none of the, the plasma transfusions and uh, uh, remdesivir. N- none of that. We didn't have any of that. At a time when we knew nothing about the virus. On the other end of this, New York has fewer deaths than Florida and Texas, states that it did not experience a surge until much later and after many of the safety standards that we've talked about had been used nationally and especially in places like New York who utilized those methods to drive down their surge, the first surge in America. It's a level of negligence that borders on criminal. It does. When the information to help people is out there and you just choose to ignore it or you choose to say, oh, well, it must not work, even though there's clear evidence before you that it works, that is, that's criminal negligence. That is letting people die because... You're more worried about being elected and making sure that you say exactly what the president says, because if you're not loyal to the president, he'll say bad things about you and you won't get elected anymore. So got to serve your guy, even if it means, you know, the people in your state die. It's criminal negligence. So to get back to the vaccine mandate from Biden. We have to understand that this mandate is a last resort. This is the last wrench in the toolbox. Imagine being Joe Biden, right? You walk into the presidency in the midst of the largest pandemic in a century, and you set up the supply chains and the distribution lines to make sure that the vaccine gets out to all Americans. And we'll credit Donald Trump in pro- pro- um, Project Warp Speed in at least getting the manufacturers to make the virus. Like, thank God he did that. But Joe Biden came in. There was no distribution system. There was no network. The supply chains were not established. He comes in office. He does that right away, immediately. The scientists at the pharmaceutical companies do work bordering on the miraculous to provide not just Americans, but all of humanity a medical solution to this issue, an issue that is killing hundreds of thousands of people. These scientists go to work for us and they come out with a vaccine in months and they get it tested and they get it into the elderly. Like I said, borderline miraculous, and people don't trust it. People just don't do it. Many people simply aren't interested in solving the pandemic. The very same people who hate masks and complain about mask mandates and, you know, don't need to social distance and blah, blah, blah. They hate the restrictions. They're the people who are doing their absolute best to make sure that we keep all of those those things around as long as possible. They're making sure that the pandemic does not end. You'd assume if we were to, let's say, be Vulcans about it, that people who hated safeguards and restrictions surrounding a pandemic would be the most eager to get over the pandemic and make sure we never have to do that again. I don't want to wear a mask. I don't want to social distance. I want to live my life. I want freedom, blah, blah, blah. Let's end this pandemic right now. Nope. Instead, they perpetuate it. It's quite illogical. They have let something akin to feelings, muddy their brains, and turn themselves into their own worst enemy. They wouldn't have to worry about mass mandates in schools if they had been vaccinated and been part of the solution from the beginning because we wouldn't need these precautions now, and they are the reasons we need them. So mass mandates and vaccine mandates now are all we have left. It's September. It's going to get cold up here in the north soon, except this year, Restaurants are open. Bars are open. Entertainment venues are open. And people are, tr- are going to pack into them 
And we are going to have a surge again. And Joe Biden knows this. The administration knows this. The health officials know this. And that's why he's doing this now. He's trying to lead a country to safety. He's trying to get ahead of it. Because like we said before, we can't put in place the restrictions that we had before because the majority of Americans have done the right thing. And to place those restrictions in place when they've been safe, when they could theoretically have large indoor gatherings, would be unfair. But the restaurants are open. So we're talk- in places where the virus has surged, in places like the Southeast, where you have large communities of unvaccinated people, this winter could be devastating. Devastating for those communities. Because they're essentially operating with no safety measures at all. They're operating as if COVID, we didn't know about it yet. They're operating like we didn't know about it yet, except instead of doing it like we did last year with the original COVID, they're doing it with the Delta variant. It could be devastating for a lot of people, a lot of people. And for those who complain about giving up rights for safety, because you hear this, you hear this over and over again, it's time to wake up, guys. It is literally the job of the president, the job of our government to ensure public safety. It's why we have a military. That's why the military exists. Their whole reason for existing is public safety, guys. That's why we dump like hundreds of billions of dollars into the military for public safety. It's why we have social programs. It's why we have the TSA. Nearly all government issues have their foundations set in keeping America safe. That's why we do most of what we do as a government. Our rights, as laid out in the Constitution, work in two ways. Generally speaking, I'm not a constitutional scholar. This is just my, me trying to wrap everything up in a box. Either a right is granted to citizens because the exercising of that right and the immediate effects of that right are confined to the individual exercising it. This is things like the right to vote or the right to practice religion. Um... If you practice a religion, you're not bothering anybody. If you're doing it in your home, if you're doing it with people of the same faith and community, you're not bothering anyone. If you go vote, you're not bothering anyone. You are not inflicting harm upon anybody else by doing or exercising those rights. Or a right is granted to the entire populace for use in public spaces in which any abuse can typically be observed and condemned, such as freedom of speech or the right to a fair trial. If I have the right to freedom of speech, That is going to be actively checked, actively balanced by the fact that my freedom of speech is operating in a public forum where other people also have freedom of speech and can check me. It's a check and a balance. No rights allow, none, zero, inherently, for harm to come to other Americans as a result of exercising that right. When I exercise my free speech, I'm not hurting someone by default. When I'm voting, I'm not hurting someone by default. There is not harm inherent in the rights. And this is the distinction that needs to be made when it comes to vaccine mandates. It is not harmful to me, as proven by exhaustive research and trials that have been accepted globally, to receive the COVID-19 vaccine, and those it would be detrimental to in life-altering ways, those people have been identified through research as well and advised not to take the vaccine. If you have you know, X, Y, and Z conditions, this vaccine is not safe for you. We know that. We've had the trials. It's been tested. So by default, with the framework we've established around the vaccine, it is not inherently harmful to take the vaccine. It is inherently safe to do so because it has gone through the safety and regulations process. In other words, nothing is... Ha- inherently dangerous about the vaccine being mandated. And especially now with full FDA approval, I can almost understand why some people would say, oh, it's rushed, hasn't been tested enough. You know, I'm going to wait for FDA approval. FDA approval is here. So if you were one of those people saying, I'm waiting for FDA approval, it's here, please go get vaccinated. This vaccine cannot and should not be viewed in any different category from any other vaccines, such as the ones we get for the measles or flu or the ones we get as kids the ones we need to go to elementary school, the ones we need to go to public school, the ones we need to serve in the military. They all meet the same criteria. The criteria. These vac- those vaccines and the COVID vaccine all meet the same criteria. They are indistinguishable as far as safety is concerned. Conversely, a constitutional right to be able to refuse a vaccine 
is not a right in which the effects are isolated to the individual. The choice not to vaccinate in the case of this virus will have near imminent negative consequences on other Americans that include moderate illness that could keep someone out of work or their families, severe illness that could cause loss of work and the accrual of expensive hospital bills, or death. And an especially cruel death, by the way, because COVID patients can't die surrounded by their loved ones. They die alone. So when you're not getting vaccinated, with the Delta virus uh, variant especially, you are condemning people to death alone. And I know that sounds extreme, but we know this because the facts say Delta is extremely contagious. It is extremely contagious amongst the unvaccinated. The unvaccinated get sicker and the unvaccinated spread it. The issue is that in most cases, blame can't be traced. And anti-vaxxers rely on this point to justify the damage to the lives of the people around them. It's the firing squad mentality. Um, You know, you have 10 riflemen and they line up and they're going to shoot one guy. They're just going to shoot the guy over there by the post. And only one or two of the guns that are the riflemen have are loaded. Someone loaded the guns away from them. They gave them all the guns. They all shoot at the guy at the same time. Guy dies and they can all leave saying, well, I don't know if it was me that killed him. I didn't load the gun. I don't know if the bullet came out of my gun. Probably didn't kill him. I can feel good about that. I can go to sleep at night. No big deal. It doesn't matter that we do that 30 times a week or, you know, in every week of the year. I know that it couldn't have been me that killed any of those men ever, really. It's that type of mentality. Because in most cases, I cannot prove you to be the person who spread a deadly virus to a person who died of COVID. Anti-vaxxers are of the opinion that what they are doing causes no real harm, which is stupid and short-sighted and wildly irresponsible and self-serving and absolutely negligent and requires such a level of mental gymnastics and mental acrobatics and such denial of clear fact, such denial of their own reality, that it is extremely hard to believe that the ignorance is not willful, if not determined. So to be clear, it is highly probable that an unvaccinated person has caused moderate hardship or worse to another American, not just another person, another American, a brother or sister who shares the same country and the same feelings about that country near and dear to their hearts. And yes, can vaccinated people or people who followed every rule and every recommendation, could a person like that have caused similar hardship. Yes, they could have. Yes, we, we, we could have seen fatal COVID cases, we, or we've seen fatal COVID cases where a person who was infected took every precaution. They didn't go out. I think I heard a case where a woman didn't leave her house and, you know, maybe opening the mail or something, and, and she died because she had such bad pre-existing conditions. We've seen that. Unfortunately, luck does play a part, right? But the people, those people, are not willfully spreading the virus. They're not doing it by choice. Those people are participating in society and they're trying to be part of a solution that benefits everyone. They are one part of a whole. Anti-vaccine are just one part of one. They aren't part of the whole because they aren't contributing to the whole and there is no argument in which that kind of person is serving their country well in this. None. Those people are not serving America. They don't have the best interest in America. They don't want America to succeed. They don't care about the lives of other Americans. They are not part of this country at the moment. They are not acting as Americans at this moment. They're acting as themselves. And to act as yourself, you don't need to belong to a country at all. You are stateless if you're doing that, especially in cases like this. To refuse the vaccine is to acknowledge that you will cause imminent harm to somebody unless you have also resolved to stay home, stay away from friends and family, to wear a mask on the occasions where you must go outside, and you adhere to all the safety regulations put forth by the experts for people who remain unvaccinated. Because I, I do know, and I know that I've been general, I do know that there are people out there who understand the virus, but are skeptical of the vaccine, 
And so they haven't gotten the vaccine, but they're doing everything they're supposed to do. They're doing everything that the CDC said unvaccinated people should still be doing. That person is still part of the solution. They have taken responsibility for their own skepticism, but they're doing everything that they can then to make sure that they are not harming others. That's okay. That makes sense. But those people are certainly not the majority, right? Of the people we see refusing to get the COVID shot or the, you know, the type of thing we see on social media. And you don't see a lot of people saying, I don't want the vaccine, but I'm doing everything else right. You don't see that argument being made at all. You see, I don't want the vaccine because I, it's a violation of my rights. I would hope that no American would want to harm another American. I would hope that. And certainly no American right would ever allow for the imminent harm of others. So this is not a right. And vaccine mandates are not a violation of your rights. Let's take the Second Amendment. Even the Second Amendment, which allows for the ownership of guns, which are you know, instruments of violence, whether you use it responsibly or not, that's what it is. That's what it's for. That's the purpose of a gun. The Second Amendment does not allow any imminent harm because in a normal circumstance, the owner is expected to have full control of the weapon. And the owner understands that if the weapon is used against another person, that the law will demand justice of them. No person has full control over the spread of the virus. None. Some people don't even know they have the virus unless it somehow becomes possible for a person to know at all times whether or not they are infected. A person will never have the ability to control the harm that they may inflict upon others. And no one has the right to knowingly inflict harm upon someone else. So due to the facts that we have here about the virus, knowing how contagious it is, knowing how severe and deadly it can be outside of a medical reason and outside of remaining as vigilant about safety now as we did last November on an individual basis, to refuse a vaccine is absolutely to inflict harm upon someone else. And that is why a mandate can be made. And that is why no such right exists in which a person can refuse the vaccine. None. Because you are causing harm. No one has the right to cause harm to someone else. As Americans, we choose to live in a society. And in a society, there is a common good. That's the point of a society. That's inherent in a society. It's part of the social contract. Every, America without ex every American without exception, every, all of us, benefit from the products of our society, whether it be through infrastructure or public services or social programs or by financial means or import and export laws even. In fact, if there is a law about a subject and that law touches any, any portion of that subject, no matter how minuscule, then that subject and any benefit that comes from it is a product of our society. Stock market, product of our society. Laws and regulations that regulate financial markets and everything else, product of our society. Free market, product of our society. Even if you live in the woods, if you've purchased one thing in America, you have benefited from the social structure that is America. It's a social contract. And, and by the way, it is a choice to live here. It's a choice. It's not a choice to be born here, but it is a choice to live here. There are hundreds of societies around the world, hundreds, and they all function in their own unique way. And if a person finds themselves unwilling to participate in causes for the greater good of the society in which they live, then they're not chained to that American life. Um, and they may likely find a society in which they are more willing to contribute for the greater good somewhere else. I'm not saying that if you don't like it here, you can leave. I'm not trying to force anyone out. But what I am saying, what, what I think needs to be made clear is that a person who chooses to put themselves above the greater good should understand that their community will notice that lack of participation. And when that person is confronted with the fact that they reap the benefits of the efforts made by all the other people, and then they're challenged on their basis for being a bystander, those people should not be surprised or angry or upset that the community at large is frustrated, annoyed, or disappointed by their behavior. That should not come as a surprise. That should not come as um, something that is unknown to you. 
if that's a choice you make, you should know that those are the consequences because you're choosing not to be part of the society. So I support a vaccine mandate. I support mask mandates. I support mandates that enhance public safety and save lives so long as they do not cause me any real harm. We should all be able to, you know, we should all be willing uh, to some level to suffer for minor temporary inconveniences to the benefits of our family and our friends and our communities. Me wearing a mask is not harmful to me in any way at all. None. Like, I'm I'm not even I'm not you know, like nurses like they get like the rashes and stuff like and they wear them every day. I don't even have to wear it that much. I just need to wear it when I go to the store. That that doesn't affect me. The vaccine, the vaccine hasn't affected me in any negative way or anybody I know. I don't know anybody who has had a uh interaction with the virus in which they now have some type of long-term negative health effect as a result of the virus. I don't know anybody. None. And almost everyone I know has been vaccinated. Almost. Almost. If I thought that a mandate was being made unjustly, without reason, without being backed by trusted experts, without being validated with the support and actions of other nations, I would absolutely oppose it. And I would oppose it by finding the facts. And those facts would be validated by the reality around me. And I would be able to demonstrate that a mandate like that would inflict imminent harm, imminent harm upon myself and others in an irreparable and irreversible way that that damage would far outweigh any supposed benefit from the mandate in question. But with these vaccine mandates, the reality around us validates the need for the mandate. We see that it works. We see the vaccines work. We also know that COVID kills people, and we also know that COVID kills people less in vaccinated areas. We have the facts. We have the experts. And something that isn't talked about nearly enough is we have the validation of other nations around us. Those nations are doing the same thing with far less controversy, with far less um, bullshit from the general populations. They're just masking up and getting the vaccine. That's what they're doing. Period. We're the only country that has this level of skepticism and animosity driven by politics. We're the only one. And the validation comes when all the other nations are following the vaccine guidelines. They're following the safe guidelines. They're not following the don't take the vaccine advice. That's not what's out there because that's not what is right. It's not what's factual. And that's what we need to be doing here is just accepting the fact that we need to get through this and we need to trust the experts and do the right thing. That's it. So just to wrap it up neatly, these vaccine mandates are coming as a last resort after the vaccine has been available for nearly a year and a half at this point, from like initial testing through, through now. Since all adults became eligible, the government has waited over five months, five months, to see whether those who are willing to get vaccinated would be numerous enough to reduce the threat of the virus to its bare minimum. And instead of a reduction of cases and deaths, we actually see an increase now. We can't even argue that we've done anything close to enough because the damage that this virus has primarily dealt to the unvaccinated of late is devastating. And worse, it creates opportunities for larger sur uh, surges in more lethal variants. If, say, only 40% of, of, of Americans had received the vaccine and the virus had diminished at that level, we wouldn't even be discussing vaccine mandates. If after 40% of Americans were um, took the vaccine and COVID just dropped to a bare minimum, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't. The mandates are here because the damage being caused by the unvaccinated population has put us in a situation that we thought we'd be well out of by now. Not just the vaccinated people, the unvaccinated people too. Right? The reality is clear. There are over 650,000 Americans dead. That's more than the population of multiple states. ICUs around the nation are reaching their capacity now. Deaths are increasing. And even though we've seen a slight decrease in case count, but only as the number of unvaccinated people begins to push upward in those hardest hit areas because the people there said, oh shit, my friends and family who aren't vaccinated are dying and they're in the hospital and they're saying, I wish I had been vaccinated. And there's nothing like that type of reality check to make people change their minds about something because guess what? 
generally speaking, people don't look forward to dying. And when reality punches you in the face, you go do it, right? And that's what's happening. But why did it need to happen? It didn't need to happen. It's so frustrating. We have known nearly the entire time that a person can be asymptomatic with this virus and they can be an asymptomatic carrier and that even a majority of cases may be extremely mild or entirely asymptomatic, which means that any one of us possesses the potential to harm other people. And the only way to negate that harm, the only way is to make sure that everyone around us is vaccinated. It's not just whether we get vaccinated ourselves, especially since data seems to indicate that vaccinated people can still transmit the virus. But that won't matter if everyone around us is vaccinated too. It means that even if a person around us has a breakthrough case, it will be a mild one. Um, And the chance of a breakthrough case resulting in serious illness or death will be so low so negligible that if it actually does happen, if that person actually does get really, really sick or, you know, God forbid, die, that it would just be a freak thing. It would just be a freak thing at that point, like being struck by lightning. And we'd also know that everyone around us did what was asked of them, um, and they tried to make the country a safe place. We can get past freak events. We do it all the time. We understand we can't control it all. We understand... We can't understand when people refuse to do something simple. That's what we can't understand. We can't understand when people refuse to do something simple and in that refusal, actively put the people around them in danger of real pain and harm. One final data point for perspective here. We've lost about 135,000 Americans since March, around the time that the vaccines were becoming widely available to the public. In a speech last week, President Biden said that for vaccinated people, Only one case, one out of 160,000, would end up in the hospital. Not dead, not dead, just in the hospital. One in 160,000 would get a case if they were vaccinated that required hospitalization. And this means that the sad and tragic reality is that nearly every life lost since vaccines became available was preventable. And those 135,000 people should still be here with their families and their friends today. Just to recap, one in 160,000 cases for people who are vaccinated would require hospitalization. They wouldn't necessarily die, just hospitalization. 160,000. We lost 135,000 Americans since this vaccine has been widely available. Every single one of them would likely be alive today every single one. And for people who have lost family members because they didn't get vaccinated, or for people who lost family members who were vaccinated but live in vastly unvaccinated communities, I don't I don't know what your anger must be because I would be filled with rage and resentment and contempt for the people around me, and I know that we strive for forgiveness, but I cannot imagine and I am so sympathetic to anybody in that situation, because you, you know, someone did this and I, and, and, and that, that's, that's what's tough for me. That's what's tough for me. So I hope you get lucky. Um, I hope COVID just doesn't find the next mutation, um, that gives it another leg up. I hope there that, you know, I hope just by pure good fortune, this thing just fades away, but I can't control that. So I put my faith based on the actual methods available to us, methods that we know work. Um, And I put my faith in fellow Americans and beyond that in humanity, because I want to believe that at the end of the day, most people are good people and most people don't want to inflict harm upon other people, even incidentally, not even by accident, in that they will back those good intentions by taking a very safe, thoroughly vetted, free of charge, FDA-approved vaccine that will give them the peace of mind that they were part of the solution when it came to battling COVID. So that is my episode for today. Um, Sources on the episode will be linked in the description 
Uh, as always, I really appreciate everyone sticking around for it. Uh, thanks for listening if you listened or watching if you watched. Uh, please like, subscribe, rate, review. Let me know how I'm doing. I'm going to try to get the other episode out later this week as well, hopefully in both audio and video forms. So uh, like I said, let me know how I'm doing. Really appreciate you guys checking in. New Deal out.